So unfortunately today's world is often not built for people with disabilities. People with disabilities around the world face really negative attitudes frequently, that the building and the infrastructure and the transport may not be accessible for people with disabilities, and people with disabilities are, are on average poorer. And so for all of these different reasons, people with disabilities are being really left behind in today's world. If we flip that around, however, and if we make a world that's built for people with disabilities in its centre, it'll be a world that's better built for everybody. Hi, this is Karin Weiss and welcome to the Medicus Mundi Switzerland Health for All podcast. And today we talk with Anna Cooper, Professor in Epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and the Director of the International Centre for Evidence in Disability. Disability affects 1 billion people globally, of which 80% live in low and middle income countries. In this episode, we will be talking about research, what decision makers need to know and how we contribute to improving the well-being of people living with disability through science. Hanna, thank you for taking part in the Medicus Mundi Switzerland Health for All podcast today. Welcome to this episode. Thank you and thank you for inviting me. When we hear the word disability, we tend to think of people being in a wheelchair. But what does the term disability really mean? It's absolutely right that most people think about people in wheelchairs or people who are blind or people who are deaf. But actually disability is a lot broader than that. So somebody has a disability if they have an underlying impairment or health condition. So they may have a visual impairment or they may have a condition such as schizophrenia. And that because of the environment in which they're living or because of lack of supports, they're not able to fully engage in the same way as everybody else. So imagine somebody who is blind and doesn't have a guide dog and is not living in an area where law support the rights of people who are blind to work, and maybe that person cannot work. So that kind of exclusion from participation is what we really mean when we talk about disability. You are the director of the International Centre for Evidence in Disability in London. What is the main focus of this centre? I'm the director together with a man called Tom Shakespeare, and we work in a very complementary way. So I am the numbers person. I work a lot about statistics, about how many people are disabled and what the kind of measurable impacts are in their lives and what kind of interventions work to support people with disabilities. And Tom leads more on the qualitative or stories aspect. So what people describe as being most important in their lives, the biggest impacts and their biggest needs. And all of our work pretty much is focused on disability in low middle income countries and how to best support the participation and improve the lives of people with disabilities in those countries. Why the focus on low and middle income countries? It's a very good question. So I have always worked in low middle income countries and I feel very passionate about that because the gaps there are so big and the health gaps are so big. And so there's a lot of need for research, but there's also a very important need for building capacity and supporting local researchers to become the research leaders in their own field. And in the last few years with decolonizing global health, that's become even more important. And also with the COVID pandemic, where it's become difficult to travel for people like me. So for me, there's two reasons why I'm passionate about working in low income countries. The one is the need and the second is the opportunities to help build strong research partners there. Before we talk about research in disability, the majority of people living with disability live in low and middle income countries. Why is that? Well, mostly that's because the majority of people live in low and middle income countries. Um, so it's about 80% of people in the world live in low and middle income countries and that's where many people with disabilities will be. There are also some evidence that um, the prevalence of how common disability is in a population is higher in low middle income countries because of factors like lack of access to good health care that can prevent and treat impairments um, because people live in unsafe environments and therefore may experience more injuries 
and so on. And what are the common problems they face? Well, people with disabilities face a wide range of exclusion. So almost anywhere you look, you'll find exclusion. So children are much, with disabilities are much less likely to go to school or to achieve well at school. Adults are less likely to be in employment, have worse health and have worse healthcare access. And as a result of that, people with disabilities are often poorer. But it's absolutely not inevitable. And if people have the right supports in place, um, people with disabilities can work and have jobs and participate in the community to the same extent as anybody else. So it's really an unnecessary exclusion that's happening. What kind of support would they need? Well, there are different levels of supports that we can think about. So one very important aspect is legal support and policy support. So that becomes illegal to discriminate or exclude people with disabilities. That then different structures need to be built in a way that they're inclusive of people with disabilities. So that schools are accessible and healthcare facilities are accessible, but also that the personnel there, the teachers, the doctors, the nurses, are well trained to be able to meet the needs of people with disabilities. And then there may also be things in place at the kind of family level, like um, providing a disability allowance to help families meet the extra costs of disability um, or support or helping to build support networks like organisations for persons with disabilities um, to support people with disabilities to take part in the community. So there's not a magic bullet. There's not just one thing that's needed. There are lots of different things. But I know that this is a health podcast and one of my interests is in the health component and how um, helping to improve healthcare access and meet the healthcare needs of people with disabilities will also help them to have a healthier life and perhaps a more independent life. You are very passionate about research on disability and access to healthcare in low and middle income countries. What does data tell us with regards to access to healthcare for people living with a disability? Well, what we know that on average people with disabilities have got worse health status and that they face lots of difficulties in accessing healthcare. And when they do access healthcare, it costs them more money and they often experience worse quality healthcare. And that all of these things are very problematic for people with disabilities and their families. And what the beauty is of evidence is it can show us where the need is and what we can do. So, for instance, within the UK, so not low middle income countries, I've recently helped support analyses on people with learning disabilities and whether they're more likely to die from COVID. And we helped with a very large scale analysis and showed that, yes, they were unfortunately more likely to die from COVID. And because of that, policies in the UK were changed so that all people with learning disabilities who are registered were invited for vaccination. And that, for me, is the kind of beauty of research is it can show you what the evidence is and then hopefully it can trigger an action that then helps to resolve the problem. But without that evidence, the action wouldn't happen. And why is there so little research in this area, given the high number of affected people? I think there's been a lack of focus on disability because um, it's seen as something very difficult and expensive and complicated to work with. And I think lots of other things like HIV or malaria, the end goal is elimination. This problem goes away. Whereas with disability, um, there will always be disability and there will always be people with disabilities and that's absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with disability. What's wrong is that people with disabilities are excluded. And so doing research on promoting the participation of people with disabilities has not been seen as, um, as enticing as doing research to eliminate HIV or eliminate leprosy. And so I think that has been one big issue. I think the second big issue is that it's been unclear as to who should fund it. So a lot of the medical research um, is interested in prevention of conditions and not so much about improving quality. And I think a lot of the disability research has been focusing on issues such as 
inclusive education and inclusive livelihoods rather than health. So it's been a double neglected issue so that not only is research on disability neglected, but research on disability and health is particularly neglected. We will come back to this issue, but let's talk about how do we measure actually disability? So that's a really good question and there's complicated ways. So the first is basically to ask people, are you disabled? Do you consider yourself to be disabled? And that's not a very good question because it's quite stigmatizing and lots of people with certain conditions wouldn't necessarily consider themselves to be disabled. They may just think I have difficulty walking or seeing because I'm old, not because I'm disabled. Then the second layer is you can ask people about functioning. And this is a very co common way. So asking people, do you have difficulties with seeing, um, with walking, with usual activities and so on? If people say they have a lot of difficulties, then they can be in one of those domains and they're classified as disabled. So that's a kind of a functional self-report. And that's the most common way of being classified as disabled in kind of research. And then the final way is to go out and try and measure whether people have impairments. So do they have visual impairments? Do they have hearing impairments? Um, or do they have mobility impairments? And although that can be important because it shows the kind of health care needs that people have, it doesn't really relate to what we consider disability, which is more of a focus on that exclusion of participation, not how much uh, we can see on a visual impairment chart. So the most common way of measuring disability is through self-report, asking people questions about functioning and what they can do. Does everyone measure disability in the same way? Traditionally, people have not measured disability in the same way, and that's produced a lot of difficulty because the different kinds of ways people use make it very difficult to compare sources of data. In the last 10 years or so, there's been a big push internationally to use what's called the Washington Group questions to measure disability. And it's uh, the most commonly used version is six questions measuring functioning, as I described before. So it asks whether people have difficulties in seeing, hearing, mobility, self-care, communication, and remembering. And if they say they have a lot of difficulty in one of those domains, then they can be classified as disabled. Now, there's still some controversy around that. For instance, it doesn't capture very well mental health conditions. But at the moment, this is the standard of what is used. And because this is now used a lot more widely, it's allowing a lot more comparative data to be collected. We know there's only a few data on disability available globally. How do you and your centre contribute to filling the gaps in research? Well, actually, since the Washington Group questions have appeared and people are more interested in disability, there's actually now quite a lot of data. There's one large um, health survey repository, so that all the surveys done on health are put there, and they're over 1,800 that include measures of disability. So now the problem is less about availability of data, but more about that people have analysed that data and disaggregated the data and um, shown how to use it. So that's one big gap, where there's, uh, which is slowly being filled. Where there is still a big gap is about what works. So we now know that people with disabilities are falling behind in all sorts of ways, but what we don't know is what interventions work to improve the inclusion and improve the lives of people with disabilities. And that's an area where in our group we're focusing a lot. Um, so to do more intervention studies to see what works, but also to start using this widely available data, these 1800 surveys, to start um, showing what's known and what it means. Can you give us an example of an evidence-based intervention for persons with disabilities that you are most excited about? A few years ago, we were working on a project in Bangladesh about childhood disability. And um, one of the biggest groups was children with cerebral palsy or other severe neurological disabilities. And there were no services in place there at all. And so ethically, 
we had to refer these children who were found for services, but there weren't many services in place. So we decided to develop an intervention and we worked together with the families and we developed a parent support programme for children with cerebral palsy and other kind of similar conditions. And that has been used very widely. And then when the Zika epidemic hit in Brazil, the children affected by Zika showed a lot of similarities to children with cerebral palsy. And we received funding to then adapt that programme for children affected by Zika and roll it out. And so that's something that I'm really excited about where evidence was used to produce an intervention, the intervention was shown to work and it's now been scaled up. And what do decision makers or policy makers need to know when designing projects and programmes for people living with disability, given the already limited resources in this field? I think the most important thing is to incorporate disability from the start. So if programmes are planned to be inclusive of people with disabilities from the start, that shouldn't cost much extra. So if you're building a school and you ensure that that school is physically accessible, that shouldn't cost much more. But if you try and adapt a school afterwards to be accessible, then that can be really expensive. And I think that is true for all kinds of interventions that we may want to do. So the importance is to plan from the start. But to plan from the start, there must be awareness about disability in the people who are planning. And so there is a responsibility, I think, to donors such as FCDO and USAID and the World Bank to say all programmes must be inclusive of people with disabilities. And we need to see that in your plans right from the start, how you're going to do that. And that's something that I'm really interested in and have been talking with donors about. But unless you specify that it's going to happen from the start and that it must happen, it's unlikely to happen. COVID-19 hit us hard and it has been especially hard for women being in lockdowns as violence has gone up and it has been in the news. What happened to people living with a disability? What do we know about this group of people? We know quite a lot about people with learning disabilities and that's because in lots of countries like in the UK there will be a record in, in your medical records that you have a learning disability. So we know that people with learning disabilities unfortunately were much more likely to die from COVID. We know very little about the mortality experience of people with disabilities more broadly. There's some suggestion of data from the UK and from South Korea that people with disabilities are more likely to die from COVID. But it's been very, very little researched. And if you look at even different groups like people who are blind or people who have hearing impairment, there's no data at all about their risks of COVID. What my colleague Tom and others have done a lot of research on is what the impact of COVID has been in the lives of people with disabilities. And although, as you say, everybody has had a difficult time during COVID, it is clear that that has been heightened for people with disabilities, that there's obviously a greater vulnerability if there's a reliance on carers, that a lot of information has not been given in the right way so that it's accessible. But the kinds of supports that people with disabilities may have in place um, to promote participation may have been wiped away during COVID. Things like um, rehabilitation, things like carers and even disability allowances may have been reduced. So there's been a really disproportionate impact of the pandemic in the lives of people with disabilities. And there's evidence to show that's led to heightened um, mental health problems and also physical declines. Is it a lack of reporting or is it a simply that this group of people is left behind? I think what COVID has done is it's revealed something that's happening anyway. So there is a group, so people with disabilities are often left behind and this is revealed through COVID. Um, there is also a lack of data about people with disabilities and that's because um, of difficulties in how disability is measured in routine data. So, for instance, we've been doing lots of work with the UK GP databases and there's no measure there that people are disabled. So then it's hard to see what the outcomes are for people with disabilities. But I think what COVID has done is it's magnified uh, 
discrimination um, that has already been in place and it just shows that people have always been left behind are now also left behind during the pandemic. In one of your talks, I heard you saying that there is a need to redefine our role in global health. What did you mean by that? I've been working in global health for about 20 years and I've seen a very big change and that's been really accelerated by COVID. So initially, uh, people like myself from high income countries, they would go to low and middle income countries and help conduct research and then come back and write it up. And then over time, there's been much stronger shift towards capacity development and supporting low and middle income country researchers to lead research. And that's obviously incredibly important because um, it's their country. They will know the country much better. They'll be able to work much more effectively and will also be able to help be in place to help use the research to influence policy and practice. So that shift has already been in place but what's happened with covid is it's been massively accelerated because we've the high income researchers have been unable to travel for the last 18 months so everything has been at a distance led by low middle income countries and so that shift that was in place already has now been happening at a much accelerated pace which is a very good thing what are your hopes and wishes for the future The International Centre for Evidence and Disability, we developed it 10 years ago, 11 years ago, and it's been really great uh, working there, setting it up, leading it and seeing how it's really contributed to the debate about disability and evidence. Um, my hope is that um, there will be centres like that in low middle income countries, leading research, um, driving forward this momentum and that the role of organisations such as my, my own will be much more supportive and technical. So my hope is that research generation, evidence generation will be much more led by low middle income countries, but also that that loop from evidence to informing policy and practice will be much stronger and that it'll be much clearer why evidence is needed and how evidence really influences practice. Because as a researcher, what can be very demoralizing is if you do research and you show that there's an issue or you show that there's a solution and then nothing is done about it. Thank you so much for this very interesting talk, Anna Cooper. I wish you all the best and a lot of success with your future endeavors. Thank you so much for having me. This was the Medicus Mundi Switzerland Health for All podcast with Gachin Weiss. You can listen to it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and on our website. To spread the message, please leave a comment on our website, share and like it. This was the first episode of the new season on disability, inclusion and human rights. Stay tuned and watch out for the next episode where we will be talking about the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and its implementation in and by Switzerland.